Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. It's David Horsager. I have a special guest today. He is a force of nature. He's generous. He's fun. He is running one of the top real estate companies in the country, and he's doing a lot more. So those of you that are, that are into sales and real estate, it'll be great. But those of you that are thinking, oh, real estate, I'm not going to listen. He, there's, we're going to talk about so many other things today. Thank you for being on the show. Welcome to the show, Chris Lindahl. Well, thank you, David. I'm so excited to be here. And I, I love what you just said there because I, you know, I used to think all the time when I'd hear in industry, I thought I didn't relate if I wasn't part of it. But what you start to realize is, is that everything applies to all industries. And so I'm excited to, to have a conversation with you today. Thanks for having me. And, 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 you know, as I've gotten to know you, you're a multifaceted force of nature. So uh, we're going to have a whole lot of fun here today. But let's, let's, let me just give you the mic for, for two minutes. What are some things people don't know about Chris Lindahl? Uh, you know, many people know this huge team, certainly in Minnesota. They know you, they see you, and even across the country. But tell us a couple things behind the scenes. I appreciate you asking that. Thank you. It, it, you know, everyone thinks of the branding, right? And and I've been fortunate enough to be the 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 front of our brand, and a lot of people know who I am. But what most people don't understand is it's all about the people, right? Every organization, and and that type of statement is so cliche, right? It's it's like oh, the people, the people, right seats and the in the right seats on the bus, and all those things. But really, when I when I look at our organization, we wouldn't be where we are today without them. Right. I mean, that's the reality of it. You could create the most amazing marketing, branding, everything else, but it all comes down to the people and all comes down to their desire to lead and grow and get into those really uncomfortable moments. And I always love you can always learn a lot about people based on how they respond when things don't go right. And so that's what we have in, in our organization is a lot of that. And I like it. Tell me, tell me this. Let's jump right in. And we're going to yeah. get more to personal and other parts. Of, but but you just you beg a question here that a lot of people are struggling with today, both retention, but more importantly, hiring. How do you get the right people? We know hiring costs, maybe two and a, uh, two and a, if we lose someone that we want to keep, it might be two and a half times hiring costs. How do we actually hire the right people? How have you done such a good, you've hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. How do you hire right? Then we can get to to keeping them, but that that's a big job because, well, the well the the people of course are our biggest benefit. They can also it can be a poison, right? So how how do you hire right? Yeah, you know, well, it takes a very long time, right? And so anyone that's that's you know that's that's tuning in today, it took us years and years and years, and we still don't get it right every single time, right? Because the reality is, is that someone can be great on a resume, they can be a great culture fit. They can interview really well, and then they show up in the real world and they don't deliver on what they sold you on, right? And so there's it's it's really challenging to 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 get that perfect, and we still have our learning opportunities. But one of the things that that I've found is if you're truly not hiring people to your core values first, you're going to have a really challenging you're going to have a really challenging situation. I'm going to jump right, right and, in. And How do you hire yeah. to your core values? Everybody talks about this. I'll hire to your core values. And by the way, this was interesting when I had uh, Horst Schultz, the founder founder of Ritz Carlton, on. He said he didn't really think assessments were that much until he found an assessment that now is just blown up. But a, but an assessment that helped him basically hire to his values. And he said the percentage of people they got right went way up. But how do you, are there any tactical things you do to hire right? Yeah. So, so there's, you know, I mean, the, the easy one is, is you can evaluate it, you know, depending on who's hiring in our case, we have HR and we have department leads. And so you could, you could do some sort of checklist. Do they, do they match the, to demonstrate these things, but it's all about the questions that you ask the candidate, right? And the easy, you know, cliche, like, are you this, are you that? Well, of course they're going to give you some scripted can answer. That's going to be easy. When you start asking questions to people that are thinking about a career inside your organization, that are in the, that are in the perspective of someone else they know. Hey, what would your spouse say about this? Or what would your best friend growing up say? What would your previous employer say about this? Give me an example in your life where this happened, right? And so when you can get them out of that just that that cookie cutter Q and A, the better you're going to be. And I and I've seen so often that 
most people that are interviewing, they don't stay in the box, right? They don't stay in the box. They ask a question and they move on. And they're just like checking questions and answers off of their sheet instead of getting real intimate. I love that you said, you know, that like, hey, we're going to get personal here too. And like, that's really important, right? When you're looking at, at connecting with people that could potentially be part of your organization, you have to be so thoughtful because yeah, there's a, there's obviously a, a ratio of, you know, what a bad hire costs you and all those other things, but there's also the culture impact of that as well. Right. And so, yeah, they, they might not be able to do the job, but if they affect the culture and all of a sudden now you brought someone in and they're not the right fit, but now 10 other people are now all of a sudden off task and they're no longer the right fit because of what that person did, it can exponentially grow and it can be super painful for an organization. So get the right questions. Any one more, one more good question or piece of advice to find the right questions. Yeah. So I always, I always love asking the question and it's, and it's not really a question, more of a statement. Tell me more and pause. Oh, I'm curious. Can you go a little deeper on that? Right. So just like, just, I think the tendency that most people have when they're looking to, uh, to hire or evaluate talent is they do all the talking. Yep. Right. They do all the talking. Like you have to be the facilitator. Right. I think of this, the last, the, uh, our, uh, one of our great recent hires, we actually really followed a process. And we really set up the question and we said, we're going to do this many interviews. This is a high, higher level person here. And we hit it, it, you know, who we hired, hit it out of the park. Happens to be who you know, Josh. He's a fantastic, yeah. perfect, amazing fit. But we followed a process that time. When I started, you know, uh, what, 22 years ago, I had these conversations and, you know, and, and once in a while, yeah, it's actually sometimes we got it right. Sometimes we didn't because of, you know, but I was all over the place. I was that guy just, well, let me just tell you, yeah. it's such an amazing place to work. We're doing such amazing work. Well, yeah, they, <laughs> that doesn't help us vet exactly the right what, people. One other thing. Yeah. Oh, spot on. One thing that you mentioned there too, that I think is also really important is you mentioned assessments. Right. And, and assessments aren't the end all be all. Right. But they definitely help you get closer and, and to have. And, and when you get an assessment, you're able to have deeper conversations with the candidate about their strengths and the areas where they need improvement. Right. To better understand, you know, what is their natural state and, and, and where do they elevate to in their career? Because it's really important because most people are not the same at home as they are in the professional setting. And understand the difference between the two. Some people have to level up their energy so much when they get into the professional setting that it's uncomfortable for them and they get pushed out of their comfort zone where others, they're the same personally as they are professionally. And so, so those assessments really help you understand that. And I, they're not the, there's no assessment that's perfect. We've done them all, but it definitely opens your eyes to sort of different things that you might not be able to identify in an interview. Do you have one that you like? offhand i mean we use a few but do you have do you have something that comes to mind offhand so th- we use there's no perfect assessment so we use several of them to sort of get the results i mean we we love culture index kobe's another one strength finders is another one and and really we input several of them in together to really get what we're looking for and the beautiful thing about our organization is because we track data so so detailed we understand from previous hires what things work well for us. That doesn't mean that someone can't have success outside the industry or in a different organization, but we're really clear on what it looks like to be successful at Chris Lindahl Real Estate. I think that's a key, knowing what it looks like to be successful. But those three really hit, hit on different angles and people's, in, in, in case people didn't hear them. Colby looks at motivation, uh, the, the culture index or predictive index are very similar. And that's been super valuable for us. And then of course, strengths finder just can give an overview of okay what are their strengths when they're at their best love it let's go backwards for a minute you know you're very young sophomore fridley minnesota your dad has a tragic accident and uh passes away tell us about that and how you kind of came through that to be who you are today no, I appreciate you asking that, David. Thank you. You know, a lot of people don't know the story. And I, I remember the moment when my career changed. But, but before I get into those details, I just want to share this really quick. I was on the front page of the Star Tribune, which is the the, the major newspaper here uh, in Minnesota. And the, the front page story was about, you know, my dad's accident. And, and it was like, here's what Chris has had to overcome in his life. The perspective of that that people felt about me changed in that moment for the people that read it, 
right? And so I think so often we tend to judge a book by its cover or we try to look at where they're at today. Like, oh, Chris Lindahl is this brand that's known all over the country and he, you know, and he's at this level, but people don't really understand the things that I had to overcome to get here. And so with, with my dad's situation, what had happened is, is him and his girlfriend were, were out drinking all day long. Um, they got in an argument um, and he walked in, she jumped in the, uh, in the driver's seat of his work van. He walked in front of the van. She hit the gas and dragged him a hundred yards and killed him. And that moment changed my entire life, right? I remember I was, you know, I don't want to date myself now, but I had a pager, right? And my mom paged me. And I remember the, seeing the house phone number on the pager and then that, that little asterisk that, and, and 911, which I'd never got a text message like that from her. And so it was, I was out for a walk. It was a, you know, it was a beautiful night. I remember exactly how, how it felt outside. Uh, and I got home and she's like, your dad's been in an accident. We didn't know any details or anything. We, we drove down to the hospital and, um, I ran into, uh, my great uncle, uh, my dad or my grandpa's brother who very successful, had a great relationship. That's actually where I really grew up, uh, learning about the out- outdoors was from him. And, what he, sh- you know, what he, what he shared with me right when I walked there, he's like, you don't want to go into that hospital room and see your dad and remember your dad like that, right? You don't, you just don't want to go in there. And, you know, being, being the age I was, I was like, ah, I'm going to go in there. And then I, and I paused for a second and I, I respected him so much that I listened to that. And it was one of the the greatest gifts that, um, that I've ever received to not go in that room. Right. I can only imagine being dragged a hundred yards to see, to see the, you know, the last memory of, of your dad, uh, in a hospital, you know, in that, in that sort of that space. Um, I'm glad I didn't do it. And, and what I realized after that, after that accident is, is my dad and I were, were, were drifting away a a bit before that because of, uh, of how often he was drinking. And you, it's, it, you know, what's interesting is, is so often I hear in really successful people, the connection to like parents, alcohol, and like, there seems to be a direct correlation there. But as I got older, I started to distance myself a bit. I'm like, I, I just don't want to be a part of this way of, of living. Mm-hmm. Not that I didn't love my dad and have a lot of respect for him. And he played a huge impact in my life, but I was growing up and I was like, this isn't what my mm-hmm. life's going to look like. And then the accident, I had to grow up really fast. And um, and I think that's part of why I am where I am today is because I did have to figure it out at an early age. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was that What easy. other mentors came around you? Yeah, the, the, the biggest one, and this is why I have such a, uh, I have such a sweet spot for teachers and coaches. Um, a guy's name's John Swanson. He was my uh, football coach in eighth grade and basketball coach in ninth grade made a massive impact in my life. We're still dear friends today. I was just talking to him the other day. We go golfing together. We go to events together. We go to sporting events. Uh, he still coaches uh, basketball and football. And, and uh, he just, he changed my life. He really did. He changed my life. And, and you hear this so often about coaches and teachers and, and uh, it, it's sports really changed my life to have that place to, to compete, to grow as a leader, to learn as a, as a young adult, um, I have, I just have so many things that I've taken from sports that I've incorporated into my professional life. Tell me about a couple of them. So the big one is the, is the competition, right? The drive, right? That's a, that's a massive one. And, and what I, what the way I was when I was younger is I'm going to run everyone over. Like I'm going to win at all costs. It doesn't matter what it takes. And as I got older, I started to realize that the competition for me is inward, right? It's an internal drive now, not external, right? I don't, you know, I, I don't disrespect anyone. You'll never see, see me say anything hurtful, hateful about anyone ever um, because I want the best and I believe in people. I push myself internally and go, okay, this is the internal score, right? You're like, all right, you got to keep going. You got to keep going. You got to get up at five o'clock in the morning. Here's what you got to do. Like, and, and you're, you're pushing yourself and, and the drive changes. You realize you get older, like, you don't need to necessarily attempt to run people over all day, every day, right? Like that's not good for, that's not good for you. It's not good for them. And when I was younger, like I just wanted to win whatever it took. Um, and so that's why, that's why when you, you know, I look at my career, right? I had that drive that it didn't matter what everyone else was doing. I knew what Chris needed to do to win. I wasn't ever worried about the noise. I wasn't worried about the naysayers, the doubters. I was like, here's what I have to do every single day to win in my life. 
And I just continue to show up. And then the, 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 the second part that, that is big, and I know you talk a lot about that, is trust, right? So I see it so often. We won't hire anyone anymore if they don't have some sort of team environment background. Right. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's sports, but really diving in and understanding how to win together, how to lose together, how to communicate in difficult times, how to have confrontational conversations when things are tough. Right. And so I learned all of that through sports. And I'm just such a big proponent. My daughter, you know, Victoria is 12 uh, and she has soccer tryouts this weekend. And we're going through that journey right now. I'll tell you right now, you know, raising a, a, a young woman in this world is not easy. Um, but we're really talking a lot about, you know, how to be the best teammate, right? You know, when you lose, how to, you know, you go, you go shake hands with everyone on the other team. You pick people up when they, you know, when they fall over, you go sit next to someone when they're injured, even if they're on the other team. And so just the amount of things that you learn from sports is just so That's incredible. That's interesting. Cause you know, you didn't have a dad for a part of your life there, uh, later on as, and, and now your daughter, what, what did this whole experience, what does it make you, what, how have you become a better leader at home? Like leading your daughter. Yeah. No, I appreciate you asking. Yeah, no, I, I really, I, I remember, you know, so I got my real estate license in May, 2009 and three weeks, you know, at the absolute bottom of the market. And a, a couple of weeks later, I found out that we were having Victoria. Right. So she was born September 2009. So it all came at once. Hey, I just went commission only. And now now I have to support a daughter that's going to be here in just a few months. So um, but I remember that moment when I found out and I said, I'm going to do things different. Right. The way that I'm going to be as a father is going to be different than the way that my father was. And and it wasn't that he was that he was that was bad. I just had the opportunity to learn from what he did right in the areas that he can improve. And one of the things from the story that I didn't share that I think is really important is that Back when, before, you know, about a couple of years before he uh, passed away, he was in the National Guard, you know, he's in the reserves and he was getting deployed and it was back when everything was going on with Desert Storm and and we thought that he was going to have to go to Iraq um, and we weren't sure if he was going to come back. And so what he did is he wrote letters to, to me, my sister and my brother and gave them to his mom, my grandma to hold on to if he didn't come back from war. It turned out that he ended up getting deployed to Russia um, and he, and he didn't, didn't end up in Iraq. But my grandma held on to those letters and the night that he passed away, she gave us those letters. Hmm. And I remember reading that letter and and I read it and I, and I could barely even read the words that were in that letter. It was so hard for me. And I took that letter that next day and I gave it to my mom and I, and I really wasn't in a position to actually read it for a long time. All the, you know, after I graduated college, I started to get a little more courage. I remembered the words and I finally asked my mom, like, hey, I'm ready to take that letter. I framed it. I have it in my house now and and I can read it. And and one of the things that's crystal clear when I read that letter is that there's certain things in that letter that my dad had regret, right? And a lot of it had to do with drinking, right? And, and he, what he said is he's like, there's things that I missed along the way because of my drinking, and also there was passion there too. He loved to play the guitar. And he said, the way that I play the guitar, it reminds me of the way that you play sports. And I know that you're going to be all right in life. Right. And so, so it's just, it, and, and, and that's a, you know, for everyone listening today, it'd be a recommendation that I give to everyone, kids, grandkids, you know, maybe it's coworkers, family members, friends is to, to write a letter that if something were to happen to you tomorrow, that someone could hand that to them. Uh, it's just such a powerful thing that I have and a, a reminder sort of of the life that 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 I'm going to live. It's my guide. It's my guide for what my life looks like and for the father that 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 I have been and I'm going to continue to be for Victoria. Most training and development initiatives don't last or even solve the root problem hindering an organization. That's where Trust Edge certification comes in. Trust Edge certified partners are equipped with a suite of tools to identify, benchmark, and close gaps in trust for good. Because when you solve the real issue, you get measurable results and a culture where people actually want to make an impact. So whether you're a trainer, a manager, an HR executive, or a leader in learning and development, check out TrustEdgePlatform.com and see how you can start solving the root issue and get lasting results in your organization. And now back to the show. So did that make you jump totally uh, as far as alcohol even? Like I've seen, I get a walk next to leaders and I get a walk, it could be senators or or it could be, you know, pro sports teams or it could be uh, CEOs. 
And um, I see alcohol actually just kill a lot of relationships and futures. Did it make you um, absolutely turn from anything like that at all? Did you, how do you yeah. navigate that? Yeah. So that's a, a really good question. I mean, fortunately for, for fortunately for me, I've, I've never been really, really big into drinking. Um, obviously those life experiences played a massive role in that. Um, but I've also been so focused on being the best leader that I can be personally and professionally that it's not a good look. If I, if I want others around me to elevate and be the best they can be in life, and then I'm off doing something different. Earlier, we talked about trust, right? If I'm, if I expect people around me in my life to be a certain way and I'm doing something completely different, like that's not going to work. They don't trust me, right? So, so if, if I'm committed to wellness and fitness and, 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 and all these other things, then if I lead by example, they trust me and they're more likely to do it. You know, how many times in life has someone actually done what you've told them to do? <laughs> Never. Right. So you have to inspire them and you have to lead by example. And so that's one really important thing for me. Tell me this. You talked about discipline before. And we, what I've noticed, at least, and all the leaders I've interviewed, um, basically all, all of them, they have certain habits and routines. You talked about getting up at five in the morning. What are, what are some routines that you have that set you up for success yeah. daily or in life? Yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, balance, rhythm, you know, everyone uses different words on what that means. Rhythm happens to be for me. I, you know, when I get up at five o'clock in the morning, my typical day, I say typical because it doesn't happen hundred percent of the time. Anyone that says they do it hundred percent of the time that life shows up and different things go on. You might be traveling, right? There's, there's, in your there's case, you're speed fishing, bumps. right? You're that, yeah. And, and fishing, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. That's part of it too. Right. Yeah. So, so the, the ideal schedule for me is, is I'm up early and I, and I, and I go for a bike ride, 15 to 20 miles. I drink a lot of water. I start the day with a lot of water every single day. Staying hydrated is super important for me. But there's some days where I've got a different agenda and I might go for a bike ride in the evening, but I don't miss it, right? It might be eight o'clock at night where it's like, you know, the, the sun's setting and, you know, the last several days in Minnesota, the sunsets have been absolutely oh, spectacular. Unbelievable. I, I, I was, know. This is, yeah. I, I got to call this out since it happened last night. I, I was biking last night, coming back and along the lake, and it was an unbelievable sunset. I did something a little different this week. So we do a few of them, but I, I did a, uh, just a sprint triathlon with my son. And I just got to try to keep being able to keep up with him heading toward 50 years old here. And like, oh my goodness, it's a, a 17 year old. He hardly has to train. It seems like to, to do it. So we just, we did one this Saturday and uh, I got whooped by his speed, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got a, I've got a 12 year old daughter that's soon to be 13 and I'm running around a soccer field right now. And, and uh, you know, all those, all those sports that I played, you know, all the life lessons I took with me, I also took with some injuries and a little bit of a sore, tired body at times. Yeah. <laughs> Any other routines? Like, uh, I, yeah. I don't know what it would be, journaling, prayer, uh, workout, uh, other things that are kind of like, this is something I rarely miss. Yes, I you know, or I do consistently. Yeah, I think gratitude's another one, right? I mean, it's, you know, just every single day that we get to wake up in this world is an opportunity Right. So really diving into like, OK, what and, and, and as I think about gratitude, I always think about, OK, what went right yesterday? Where do I have room for improvement? And what am I going to do today? And, and and speaking of that rhythm, sometimes I do that before I go to bed. And sometimes I do that right when I wake up, depending on the day. But I always reflect. Right. And that's in. And, 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 you know, there was something I just shared in our all company meeting the other day is that. If anyone is feeling a certain way about something I did or something I said or suggestion for improvement or any sort of constructive feedback, I'm 100% open to anything that anyone wants to talk to me about. And someone actually pulled me aside after the meeting and shared a few tips that will improve my life. And I think that's the same thing about leading by example. If I can stand in front of our entire company and say, there's no question off limits, we can have any conversation that we want. I think it's super powerful to reflect because I've seen so often that people aren't willing to look in the mirror and be real and honest with themselves, right? There's so many people in the world right now that are, that are just totally delusional about who they are and where the areas are for improvement. Totally. And so the more that I can be honest with myself, the better I'm going to be. Individuals, leaders, and companies. If, if Many people, they want to know what they, they, they want to win and they won't ask their customers how they could. 
<laughs> you know, it's like I know. many of them would tell them, and same with leaders. Oh, you want to be a good leader, but ask your people. You know, this this feedback can be so valuable and can be yeah. the uh, you know such a huge opportunity that's missed. You know, jumping into your be generous. <clears throat> you know, you've got a new mission or not. <clears throat> You know, it's 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 been you've become this this be generous. You at the beginning you had this drive, and it is probably a little self focused uh, twenty or, or thirty years ago. And now you really have become this this mission of be generous, and your your whole foundation supports this idea of be generous. Tell us about it. Yeah. So so originally it was it was the be generous project, and what I realized, and you know, we always have learning opportunities along the way, even for the amount of branding that we've got right, you know, throughout uh, my career, we we tied we we named the uh, the five hundred one c three be a generous project, and everyone would go, what does that mean, right? And so the name that everyone knows is Chris Lindahl. So now it's the Chris Lindahl Foundation, and be generous is the mission, and we give back our time, treasures, and talents. And what I've learned along the way is the easy thing for people to give is money, right? That's the easy thing to give. And I'm not saying that people are giving hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, but even if it's a dollar on GoFundMe, it's really easy to click a couple of buttons and say, I contributed to that cause. What's difficult is sharing what you've learned because a lot of people in the world have a scarcity mindset. Right. So, oh, if I share this with them, then they're going to be able to take me out. And that's our secret sauce. And so you see so often that people are so scared to share what they've learned. And I want to be around more abundance mindset. People are like, hey, let's give and share everything. And over time, it will level up everyone. And that's the environment that I want to be in. And then the third one is time is time. That's the hardest one for people to give. And you know how crazy life is for so many people right now. But what we found inside of our world, right, our community of, of, of people inside our organization, our customers, our past clients, and all of our supporters, is that people want to get behind that group environment of giving back and making a difference. And what very few people in the world think about is legacy, right? And so when we see people come with their friends, their family, their kids, their grandkids, their nieces, their nephews, and they all come together to give back all three of those. It's such a beautiful thing because they're creating this long lasting legacy that's going to be there forever. And I just love being a part of it. How about this? Let's, you know, you're known, and I think this might have something to do with it, but I want to hear the story firsthand. But you're known for your arms wide open. You've been on billboards around the country, across the country, these wide open arms that everybody's, seen, you know, everybody in Minnesota has seen, but everybody, you know, a lot of people have seen. Tell us about where that came from. So it was the desire to be different, right? So I think one of the things in, in, in business is that you have to differentiate yourself, especially in an in industry that, I mean, most industries these days are, are in some shape or form or some sort of commodity, right? There's a lot of, you know, a lot of people that homeowners could reach out to, to sell their house. Everyone knows like 10 real estate agents and the desire to be different. I mean, I remember the, the, the first photo I took and it was, you know, Chris Lindahl in a suit and tie, just like everyone else that's been that same way forever. You know, a lot of people have probably seen bus benches all over their communities, right? Realtors forever have done that same thing. And I'm like, let's shake it up. Let's do something different, right? And and we tried a couple of different things. The one before the arms out was Chris nine times in a row in a suit and tie, right? And it was, I remember back then it was, I, I sell a house every nine hours and it was nine, you know, photos of Chris. And, and I thought that was going to be like, oh, this is going to break through. Like everyone's going to go like, why are we seeing Chris Lindahl nine times in a row on a, on a billboard? And then all of a sudden we, we, we came up with this idea to do the arms out, which means a whole lot more to us, right? Of, of, I mean, trust is a big part of that, right? Love, you know, a lot of people have related to like free hugs, giving back generosity, like arms wide open. And, and there's a lot of things that, that have, that have come from that arms out. And what I love about it is it's all in the eye of the beholder. Anyone driving by it, they all go, I wonder what that's all about. I wonder why he started that. And so everyone genuinely has this like curious state of what does arms out actually mean, right? And so it, it's just a disruption. Yeah. You've won, you know, and, and, and thrived in a very competitive market and in so many ways. 
tell, give me three differentiators, or maybe just touch on them. I, I think there's, at least from what I've seen, this, this scholarship idea, the arms open idea, the the um, way you guarantee a sale. Like, what are the, what are you, when you say, hey, what are the differentiators? Because I, I know, I don't want to stay in real estate forever here. Most people listening have nothing to do with real estate, but people, you, what you've done in your space other than be generous, other than love people, other than figure out hiring the right people and being a, an example to them and building this great culture, you you that front end there is a uniqueness that is absolutely clear, and I think people need to get this. Clarity is one of the is the first pillar of trust. Being clear, we trust the clear, we mistrust or distrust the ambiguous, and so how do you, you're clear about a few things that make Chris Lindahl Real Estate absolutely different than everybody else. No, I I, I love that question because it the. Obviously, the successful campaigns and the innovation uh, do differentiate us, but having people in the right spots in the organization matters more than anything. I am an off the charts visionary. Like you look at any of the assessments, I almost break it because I'm so high in vision. No detail, zero follow up. Like I own that space and everyone else around me does too. And, and I look at the early days and there was almost like this guilty feel of being a visionary because I couldn't follow through on other things. And then, you know, you had people that like, almost like parenting, where you had people in the organization that started made me like, you didn't follow through on this, you didn't do that. Like, and now I have people around me that embrace who I am. And, and those ideas and, and campaigns that you mentioned, those are all my ideas, right? Because I'm in that vision spot and I stay focused in that place, it makes a big difference. And having really dedicated ops people and integrators and people in our organization that are so dialed in on getting things to the finish line. I have a thousand great ideas a day, 24 hours later, there's about five that are still decent. And 72 hours later, there's one that I'm like, oh, that can change the industry. And so the other thing with that too, is what makes us so special is that we really don't get that many great ideas to the finish line, right? One of the mistakes that most people make inside organizations, especially when they have a visionary, is they give everyone in the organization whiplash all day, every day. Let's go here, let's go there, let's go here, let's go there. And everyone's running around completely dizzy. And we have so much discipline to vet ideas before we ever get them to the finish line. And that's one thing that most people don't figure out, but it also has to do with the way you hire, has to do with the assessments, has to do with clarity, has to do with trust, has to be, you know, with the vulnerable, transparent conversations I mentioned earlier. All of that comes together because you can create all the most amazing marketing campaigns and innovation in the world, but if your people can't execute on it and they're exhausted and they're fried and they're burnt out, you're not going to last. It's going to, you've seen it a hundred times before. It's like that flash in the pan where all of a sudden they shoot up. And all of a sudden, like they decline or they go out of business or they file bankruptcy. And I remember in the early days when we first started this, everyone said, oh, this is never going to last. There's no way that Chris Lindahl can continue to do this. And we just continue one after another. We just keep climbing, keep growing, tune out the noise. We don't respond to everyone. We just keep doing what we do. And, and you're right. Like a lot of the things that we've that we've really invested in and, and, and made big actually came from one thing. And you said it earlier. It came from our customers. We listened to what our customers say, right? Our customers said, hey, we'd like to have this. We look at emails. We look at text messages. We go to appointments. What are people saying that they need in this market right now? And that tells you where to go. People all the time say like, hey, Chris Lindahl is a marketing genius. I just am really good at listening. So yes. uh, as we get toward the last Question or two here. What's I want to go back to one of the words that came out early, and it's drive. You have an enormous amount of drive. You have an enormous amount of vision. In a day where a lot of people are looking to work less and work, you know, certain things around work-life balance and certain things. I, I, I just, from what I see, a lot of the healthiest people, mentally, physically, in other words, actually are are kind of, are actually work like work is a healthy big part of their lives though you know but but how it's not just you it seems like you've hired driven and motivated a certain type of drive toward an exciting positive possibility how do you actually in this environment motivate this go the extra mile align we're in this together we're this this drive that is positive it's generous and a host of other things but how i guess in this world are you taking hundreds and hundreds of people and basically hiring and motivating drivenness? 
Yeah, I yeah, that's a re- that's a really good question. I think that's a big uniqueness, by the way. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot and, of people that aren't today. That's right. And, and and one of the things when people hear the word drive, that I think where there's some real major confusion when people hear the word drive, they think workaholic. Mm-hmm. Right. They always think that like, oh, I don't want to work. You, you mentioned, you know, the work life balance, which suggests that there's some sort of 50 50 teeter totter. Right. And people all the time, they, they think that that all of a sudden Chris Lindahl is 24 seven running through walls and never stops working to get to this point. Right. And, 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 you know, obviously at the beginning of any journey of, of any business, right, when you're on your own, you tend to work more. You have to make a lot of sacrifices. You know, anyone that's done anything big, there's a lot of sacrifices they had to make along the way to get there. But when, when we hire people, we ask the tough questions before we hire them. Hey, what does life look like when things get tough? What do you do? Give us examples. Tell us more. What do people around you feel when things get tough for you? Right. So we're asking a lot of questions about challenging times. You know, it's, it's, it's like anything, you know, you learn a lot about people when things go wrong, right? When things are great, it's, it's really nice and fun and Hey, we're winning. Everyone's winning. It's, it's all good. But then the moment that flips and all of a sudden it's like, Ooh, We didn't expect that to come. Oh, we had a little more turbulence than we expected. Then all of a sudden you start looking around and you start understanding like, okay, this is what they're built for. This is what, this is what is inside. And I think you can't really train that. You just have to find people when you're evaluating talent that have that level that when things get tough, they show up because there's two types of people in the world right now. When things get tough, there's a lot of the world to just shut down. Right. They're like, I can't even get out of bed. I'm not going to get up. Things are going wrong. What's going to go wrong today? And then there's the other side. They just embrace those opportunities and they're so excited to enter that growing season. And the thing that I've seen so often in life is that when all these challenges come up, you're actually growing so much. But when you're in that moment, it doesn't feel like you're growing until you get outside of it and you look back and you go, wow, those were some of the greatest opportunities of my life. And, and so I just, I love those moments because that's really where you grow. Well, this has been fun. I've got one more question for you before I do, Chris. There's so much more I could ask you. I know there's a bunch of differentiators I've heard about, read about. I think you have a new uh, partnership come with the Minnesota Twins and a host of other things happening that are exciting and interesting and a whole lot of not just how you hire, but how you built such a great culture. We might have to have you back. Before that, you've written the best-selling book, Sold, but where's one place we can find out more about Chris Lindahl or connect with you? Yeah. So, so the best place is connectwithkl.com, which is right there on that link is all my social media channels. I personally manage my social media. I love, you know, getting messages from so many people that hear and see, and then I get to connect with, uh, around the world. And so if you're listening, you know, make sure to follow me, send me a message. I'd love to hear what things I can do better based on the interview that you just listened to today. And all that will be in the show notes at trustedleadershow.com and more about Chris Lindahl. Hey, this has been a treat, Chris, you know, It's the Trusted Leader Show. Last question. Who's a leader you trust and why? The biggest one for me is coaches and teachers, right? And so I mentioned, you know, John earlier, who's made just a massive impact in my life. And and, uh, he's one that that I call all the time for advice, um, just to to level set and figure out how I can improve in life. And uh, he's just played a a major impact in, in my life. Everybody needs a teacher, a coach, and a mentor and a friend, right? Walk beside you, walk ahead of you, walk behind you. We need them. Well, Chris, thanks so much. This has been a treat. And this has been the Trusted Leader Show. Until next time, stay trusted.